Thank you, Dean Bobo. Um, I, before I begin, uh, we have a remarkable video um, celebration of the 50 years of African and African American studies that we have keyed up. So we're going to play that, let our panelists see it so that they can look for themselves and their friends, uh, get some good testimony. And then we'll invite everybody up and I'll do the introductions and say a little bit about the opening panel. So thanks. and counting of one of the best programs on this planet. Happy 50th anniversary. I am thrilled to be a part of the legacy of trailblazing scholars from this department, and I am looking forward to seeing the department continue to flourish in the future. Uh, a department that was more like a home at Harvard for me, and that completely transformed my life. I feel honored and privileged to be able to engage in this kind of pedagogy and learning on a daily basis. And that's all thanks to AAAS. I couldn't do this without the knowledge and wisdom I received from the best in the field, meaning professors, fellow students, and administrators in AAAS. My experience there was one of self-discovery. It was a place where I finally was able to find the words to articulate my experiences as a young African-American woman from the South of the United States. And from there, I was able to find my voice. As much as my professors taught me about the field, how to read, how to write, the public impact of studying African-American history and culture, I learned just as much from my fellow students. I will be graduating um, from Oxford University with my PhD in education policy this year. And I know none of that would have been possible had it not been for the amazing mentors who were intellectual stalwarts and exemplars for me um, at, um, in the department. Harvard AFRAM offered me tremendous role models of academic leadership of critical scholarship, of dedicated teaching, of excellence, and institution building against the odds. It helped me to put my experience in perspective and yet understand that there are different perspectives, but we all are one. AFROAM gave me the ability to speak with confidence about the depth and breadth of the African American experience in particular. It gave me the ability to tie that to the African experience and to carry that throughout my professional career. I don't know how else I would have had the opportunities that I've been afforded since graduating um, and entering racial justice spaces and work and organizations that never would have happened without the support, the tutelage, the community of the Department of African American Studies. I will always remember is that it was in the African American Studies Department where I first received any serious attention as a student from a faculty member. And I think the other concentrators felt the same. It was my faculty who made me love Black Studies. We were all given the space to grow intellectually and it provided the framework for many of my pursuits after. Um, I continued after college as a community organizer and activist uh, working on events like the Million Man March. I pursued graduate studies in history at Columbia University working with the late Manny Marable as the manager of his Malcolm X project. Both of my novels were published with HarperCollins. Both of them are historical fiction. Both of them were significantly influenced my, by my degree at Harvard. Um, I can't say enough about what that experience meant for me. I definitely feel the impact of my learning in undergrad. Um, I feel empowered and as an ambassador to make positive changes in uh, the African-American community to help serve and educate and strengthen and improve and uplift my community. Into bear history and anthropology and all the various factors into decision making has been very instrumental 
and played a huge role in my success. It was really helpful to be able to learn both history, culture, um, race, all of the things that I think would be valuable for anyone to learn, but especially someone growing up black in America. I want to thank those who came before me the late 60s and 70s who got this department started and those who were there from my era who grew it so significantly and those who are there now who are continuing to grow it. Audrey Lord, James Baldwin, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, and I realized that I needed to spend time in the department. It was filling a gap um, in my education and my political coming of age. Afro-Am, which it was called at that time, was a haven for me in a world that doesn't always call for creativity and free thinking. It was a place where I could open my mind. My now husband, Oludamni and I, met while I was at Harvard and he was a graduate student in the department. We have since been married for five years and we have a three-year-old son, so the department really has a family of fans. With Dr. Gates's help, some of us went to South Africa together in the summer of 1993 to do voter education work ahead of the country's first free elections. I want to thank you for introducing me to East Africa, which continues to be such an important part of my life and career, and for teaching me to challenge every level of American society in pursuit of racial justice and equity, particularly in the world of healthcare. Here's to the next 50 years. So thank you, AFAM department, and here's to 50 plus more years of doing the work and teaching the people. So a group of us decided to protest, and we went into University Hall, and we sat in one evening. It was about seven or eight of us, and we were joined by dozens of others outside over the course of the evening. Um, the administration vacated the building. They deemed us some kind of menace. Uh, the cops came in, they took our pictures. I was thinking about my FBI file. Uh, and at the end of the night, we came out and it didn't seem like we really made much of a difference. But shortly thereafter, Professor Gates was hired, uh, Professor Appia, Professor West, and suddenly we had a viable department. It is truly an honor to celebrate 50 years, 50 years with this department. So it is a tremendous honor for me to be up here this morning. Uh, not only am I a uh, assistant professor in the department, but as many of you know, I am also an alum of the department. Uh, I graduated in 2005. And when I first came to Harvard, um, my the, the day before my first day of school was September 11th, 2001. Uh, you know, I'm away from home for the first time. Uh, this major earth shattering event happens and we are all utterly bewildered. We don't know where to turn, what's gonna change about our way of life. Uh, I remember walking on Mass Ave, um, seeing a, 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 a Muslim woman uh, assailed by a group of drunk white men on the street. And it was just a terrifying moment without a lot of clarity. And I always think back to that moment uh, because shortly thereafter, they invited Professor Cornell West to speak at the Kennedy School. Uh, he had just released the album and uh, he, he spoke then of what he said was the niggerization of America. That there was something about the black experience and being permanently subjected to arbitrary violence, humiliation, vulnerability, that now the broader nation was having to wrestle with. And the question was how we were going to respond to that moment. Were we going to respond with the best resources of the African-American tradition? Or were we going to retreat into forms of false projection of power and terrorism ourselves? We all know how that story turned out. 
But the important thing was that Professor West was mining a history of African American life and culture to point toward a different way. Shortly thereafter, in the Harvard Black Men's Forum, I was introduced to Professor West personally, and then Professor Gates, both in the same month. It was October of <laughs> 2001. And I knew then that I'd never heard of African American studies before I got here. I didn't really think about being a college professor, but meeting them, I knew from that day that's what I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And they and the other faculty members in the department helped someone like me who grew up around and lived these questions that are not just academic abstractions, but questions of mass incarceration, ghetto poverty, uh, the, the, the long history of racial injustice uh, in the United States, particularly concentrated in our metropolitan areas. Somebody who lived those things to, to give me a way of thinking through the ethics of the response, the history that informed those lived dilemmas. And in giving me those opportunities and opening my mind, causing me to question my deepest assumptions, African and African American studies gave me a life, a vocation. And so it's just an honor to be here with you all. It's an honor to work alongside all of the people who were such a big part of my education, Tommy, Marcy, Larry, Ingrid Monson, Bill Wilson. When Tommy jokes about the dream team, I often feel like Christian Leitner, who they just invited to get to come along <laughs> to Barcelona. <laughs> but it's an amazing, amazing experience. And so it's an honor to be here to, to moderate this panel today. So let me very briefly introduce our speakers, their full bios, their illustrious bios are in your uh, program. Um, and they'll speak for about eight to 10 minutes about the influence of their time in African and African American studies on their broader trajectory through life, and then we'll get into a dialogue. But first, and, and we'll do alphabetical order, let me welcome Terrence Carter, class of 2001, who is the co-president and head of TV at Westbrook Studios, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith's production company, former executive at Fox, and the man responsible for greenlighting uh, Empire and a number of other amazing television programs, the most successful black television program of all time. Uh, I also want to welcome Sue Lee Stinson Clay, class of 1992 who's chair of the corporate group and managing partner at McKinnon, Shelton, and Hen LLP. As you saw in the video, she's one of the leaders of the great protest that uh, led to the decisive action that, that um, uh, made possible the hiring of the Dream Team. Uh, also, my dear, dear friend and buddy, Sangu Delhi, class of 2010. He's an entrepreneur, investor, and author. He's the managing director of African Health Holdings and Golden Palm Investments. He just published a new book called Making Futures, Young Entrepreneurs in a Dynamic Africa. And although you always worry about this at a Harvard event, I do think he's the only person today who's got an MBA, a JD, and a PhD. He's a very conspicuously educated Negro. <laughs> And we are real honored to have him here today. I also want to welcome, and it's a great honor, real honor to welcome Professor Miles Link, who's class of 1971. He's the Peter Kiewit Foundation Professor of Law and the Legal Profession, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Arizona State University. He is one of the original members of the faculty student committee to establish the Afro-American Studies Department. And it's, uh, it's no um, exaggeration to say that without his work and his sacrifice, we wouldn't be here today. So it's a real honor. And also, finally, last but not least, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome my friend uh, Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, class of 2000. She is a uh, widely celebrated and award-winning writer and journalist and the author of the best-selling book, Harlem is Nowhere. Uh, which is a fantastic book, and I uh, hope you all get a chance to check it out. So please welcome our panelists. Give them a big round of applause. 
And I think it's only right that we start with Professor Link. Thank you very much. And yes, it's really an honor to be here. I'm somewhat of an interloper on this panel since I am not a graduate of the department, and, but yet I helped uh, to create it. And um, I'm just delighted to be here. It, it is, uh, there are, uh, one of the things that's hard to communicate to those of you who've been here for the last 50 years, who've seen the department grow, is what an emotional experience it is to come back and see that you've not just survived, but you've thrived. The department is a living part of the Harvard community, and it is, it fills me with pride, and I, and I must say, yesterday afternoon I was almost, I was telling uh, uh, Brandon that I was almost brought to tears. It was just such an emotional experience. I do, however, want to go back to 69, and I want to talk about the experience of the Faculty Student Committee and to answer some of the questions that were raised yesterday about some of the decisions that were made. Um, that was an incredible time. The, you know, diamonds, the most precious gemstone, is formed under intense pressure on carbon. The gemstone of this department was formed under intense pressure to create something. The Faculty Student Committee who established the Afro-American Studies Department, which was subsequently renamed the Standing Committee on African-American Studies, was a unique entity at Harvard. Never before had Harvard students been involved in creating a department. On that committee, you had representatives from throughout the university uh, uh, disciplines and community, and you had students who had been actively involved in the uh, protest. I had spoken at the big uh, Memorial Stadium event in uh, April, and I'd been very involved in advocating for a Department of African American Studies. Professor, then Professor, later Dean Rozovsky's report was an excellent document that came out at the end of 68. It was an excellent document. Had it come out at any other time, it would have set the template for an interdisciplinary program where African courses and African studies were integrated into other departments. The one thing the report did not do was agree to establish a department of African American studies, and that was something in the context of the late 60s, after Martin Luther King's assassination, that the black community and the students at Harvard felt was absolutely necessary in order to ensure that such a program, such a department, was not subsumed into some other uh, discipline. If I can, I want to go over just the, the people who were on that committee. It's, it's an interesting and, and remarkable group. Professor Harold Amos from Bacteriology and Immunology. Kathy Bowser, Radcliffe 72, she was one of the students. Leslie Griffith, known as Skip Griffin, Har he was Harvard uh, class of 70, he succeeded Jeff Daniels, whom you heard uh, yesterday, as the president of AFRO. So he was the AFRO president at that time. Loretta Harge, another Radcliffe student, Radcliffe 72. Clarence James, Harvard 72. And I think if he were here, he would not disagree with me, one of the most radical of the <laughs> students at that time. Uh, Professor John Kane. And Professor Bobo, I want you to know how much I appreciated your reference to him. I often feel that his contribution and his commitment is sometimes forgotten. He was on that committee. He and I were the subcommittee to establish the Du Bois Institute. And so answer one of the questions from yesterday. Yes, we thought the Du Bois Institute should be a part of and affiliated with the department, but should be separate in its leadership from the department. It should be a research program. And, and, and a research institute that should have its own leadership. But John Kane was an economist, a very straight-laced traditional, I mean, he was, and yet he felt the need and, and, and he was willing to engage. And it's just a remarkable man, and I'm so glad to see he's not forgotten. I was on the committee, um, actually Harvard class of 70, but. Uh, Professor Juan Marichal, Romance Languages. Professor Talcott Parsons, the great sociologist. Uh, Mark Smith, uh, Harvard student, class of 72, another very radical student at the time. Professor Zeph Stewart, classics professor. Uh, as a lawyer, he's famous to me because his brother Potter Stewart was a Supreme Court justice. Um, Professor Charles Whitney of astronomy. 
and the chair of the committee, Professor Richard Musgrave, Economics and Law. And Professor Musgrave had, was appointed by the dean of the faculty, chair of the committee, because he had spoken out at a faculty meeting in favor of considering the idea of a department. And so he was tasked with chairing this committee. The idea of herding cats gives you no idea of what chairing this committee was, was, was like. Our meetings were intense. Some of these faculty members were skeptical. Having students involved in the process was antithetical to some. Every decision we made, every meeting we held, every conclusion we reached was unprecedented. The very fact that we were meeting and having students was unprecedented. There were meetings when Professor Musgrave, I thought, would, would just throw up his hands in frustration, but he didn't. Our charge was we had to come to the Faculty of Arts and Sciences with a report announcing organizing a department by the fall of 69, for the faculty meeting in September of 69. And that meant a lot of decisions had to be made which were unusual. Uh, Professor Patterson yesterday asked the very pertinent question, why was you at Guineer chosen as chair of the department? The answer, of all the people we contacted to chair the department, some of whom subsequently became involved in the department, none was other than you at Guineer was willing to accept that appointment. Uh, John Hope Franklin was contacted, but given, as you heard yesterday, his experience with the history department here, he was not willing to come. Most people who were contacted, established scholars in the field, wanted a joint appointment with some other department, their area of expertise at Harvard, because it was not at all clear the Afro-American Studies Department would survive for two, three, four years, let alone 50. No other department in the university was willing to give joint appointments under those circumstances, given this was being created as a new department. And so we could not find someone else who had a modicum of credentials and qualifications other than <coughs> Dr. Guineer, uh, Professor Guineer, and his, frankly, his experience in the labor movement, we felt prepared him to deal with some of the conflicts and controversy he would have to deal with as the department went forward. So that was a decision that was made out of necessity. It was made in light of the circumstances we faced, and it, was, um, it, it allowed the department to go forward. We invited um, Ephraim Isaac uh, to become the first faculty member, and I remember I, I took Ephraim to lunch, and he said to me, he said, Miles, should I accept this appointment? And I said, Ephraim, we need you to accept this appointment. We need you in the department. Now remember, then it was the Department of Afro-American Studies. Ephraim Isaac is one of the great African scholars, African language and Semitic studies. And we knew then that there had to be a relationship between the African-American diaspora and the African homeland. And Ephraim provided that. Uh, and so he accepted. We reached out to others, and we were able to put together a proposal, the Musgrave Report, that went to the faculty and they approved it. That created a department. Every subsequent change, every subsequent amendment was an amendment to that original. But had there not been a department, had we gone to the faculty and said, you know what, we couldn't do it, too hard, a lot of members of the faculty would have said, excellent, great, no department, and move on. <laughs> Had that happened, do any of you really think in 70, 71, 72, they would have gone back and said, okay, now let's do it? Would not have happened. So this was, <laughs> now obviously, I'm, I served on the committee, so permit me, to, I'm self-interested, but it was, now I'll tell you a personal, a personal point I've, I've, I've advised I'm over. The experience was so intense that I actually took my senior year off from Harvard. I went into VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, and so I, I changed from one frying pan to the fire. I was sent to the pruitt Igo Housing Projects in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and that's a whole other story. But, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
I have no prepared remarks, so I guess you'll have to just bear with me here. Um, I guess I'll first uh, repeat the point. I think yesterday was really mind-blowing for me. Uh, I, I almost came to tears as well, honestly. Uh, and just to see what's happened because I have not been around. And so I just want to say thank you, really, honestly. Um, also, uh, I guess I also had a bit of anger. I think I, I was feeling a lot like I felt back when I was a junior in college because I missed out on all of this. So uh, that's, that's real. So uh, I guess what I would like to talk about is, um, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about what happened. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in, in my day, uh, and I, I, I was trying to think why I became an Afram concentrator, and I really don't remember why. Uh, I think I took a couple of classes that I really liked, and it was something that you know, was taught in the home, and uh, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to read. And so uh, Afram at that time, well, actually, uh, Professor Huggins was here my freshman year, and then he passed away. And when he passed away, there was... No African Americans left in the department, and we had two professors. We had Professor Solers and we had Professor Johnson, both of whom were in other departments. So we really had one one professor. <laughs> and at that time, there was a big push by the Black Students Association uh, for more African American professors in the university. And the Black Students Association, being political as they are, um, wanted to use the Afram department as a reason to push forward for more African Americans at the school at large. And the administration was all for that. So, you know, they were meeting with BSA and Derek Bach and having lots of conversations. And we were kind of in the background, often never invited um, to the meetings. And to me, it seemed as though, talk about, you know, ghettoization. Like, why do black professors have to come to Afro-Am? And then why does Afro-Am have to have only black professors? We didn't care what color they were. We were just trying to get an education. And so quickly our interests diverged, and the BSA was very big on negotiating and having meetings with Derek Bach, and I don't know what they were doing. Uh, and, you know, meanwhile, the clock is ticking. And we could very well feel that the administration was just trying to wait us out. You know, we were juniors, so we're going to be gone. <laughs> so, you know, the trouble would be over. So. Uh, it really became uh, crunch time for us, really. And we had heard the stories, you know, the stories. I, I used to work at the faculty club, and uh, Dean Epps would come in all the time. And, he, and I laughed yesterday when I saw the picture of him being marched out of University Hall, because <laughs> we used to have a story I can't really tell about how, about what we, he used to say, right? <laughs> and uh, I saw him, because, you know, there was this, he would tell the story of how, you know, he was in University Hall, and students took over the university, or the offices, and then they marched him out. <laughs> and that's, there's like you have to go see. There's a picture of it. I had to. I really did crack up when I saw it. Um, and um, you know, so that whole history of sit-in, protest, university hall. I mean, we didn't really see any other way. So we packed our sandwiches and uh, got ready to go over there. And you know, Harvard students are uh, not the most politically active when it comes to things that could get you kicked out of school. <laughs> so trying to get people to come sit in with us, uh, was really challenging, honestly. And luckily, um, or unluckily, um, at that time, the law school was having a lot of activity around Derrick Bell and students were protesting, sitting in at the law school at that time. And so we found allies. Uh, and I would say, I don't remember the numbers, but maybe 25, 30 law students who we had never met and had no attachment to AFOAM said, you know, find us a place to sit in, you know, we'll come. So they came and they, uh, and they sat in with us. And during the course of the day, well, we first came into the building and then it, it was strange to me because they immediately cleared the entire administration out of the building. Now, there's not that many of us. We're sitting in a little foyer and they clear the whole building. Um, they, uh, you know, brought in the cops. Uh, they took our pictures. They um, seemed to overreact, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, we decided we were going to stay. And over the course of the day, people said they weren't spending the night, so they trickled out. So by the end of the day, there was probably only about seven of us who decided well, we were going to spend the night in there on those cold floors. So uh, well, that's what we did. And people heard about it. 
And I see Zai here sitting up here. He was one of the leaders. Uh, uh, he brought in, I would say, a couple hundred students were outside of the building. And we could see them out the window. They were singing and chanting and marching. And they stayed out there all night, too. And the next morning, we just came out. And I think we made the globe. I think we were in the paper. And we went about our business, hoping that they weren't going to throw us out of school. <laughs> and, and literally, I mean, it, it was weird. And I'm sure if you asked the administration, they would say, well, we were already going to hire Skip. But immediately thereafter, Skip was hired. And um, you know, like I said in the video, we, we suddenly had this viable department. Now, it was a little too late for us. Uh, we were we were we were gone uh, very shortly thereafter, but uh, it really is so amazing to you know hear what has happened in the years since, and you know I'd like to think that we played a little part of that. So, I, I actually I wouldn't even have thought it was so until I went to lunch with uh, Dr. West. Uh, I, I ended up going on to the law school. And I was in Dr. West's class, and we sat down for lunch. I don't know if you remember. You probably don't remember. Uh, but he said, you know, I would not have been here if it were not for you all. And that was kind of the first time it hit me that, wow, you know, we actually maybe made a difference. And, uh, you know, the AFRAM studies, I, I, I did learn something here. <laughs> uh, I realized it in law school because law school is really the history of race also. So, uh, you know, so that, you know. Amen. <laughs> so in my, my very last class ever at Harvard was Randall Kennedy's class on race relations. Mm -hmm. I figured, you know, this is a cakewalk. And it was a uh, five-credit course. I never had to go. Got a flat A, you know. And I can attribute all that to, to AFRAM. So I do appreciate the opportunity to have been educated here, and uh, and I'm really glad that this department is touching so many lives. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, it's just a wonderful pleasure and honor to be invited to be here um, on the eve of my 20th reunion. It's nice to dip mm -hmm. my toes back into this, what feels like a dream landscape. I almost don't realize that this was such a huge part of my life. And I wanted to um, begin by talking about dreams because uh, that was how we began. When I found myself at age 19, the student of a pioneer of American theater, Adrian Kennedy, who was one of the many artists I had the, um, and the honor of sitting at the feet here as a student. She had us record our dreams. Um, with the idea that the structures and stories and worlds that emerged there could lead us in our waking life to um, the work that we had to do. And it was also in the era of dreams that I came here. I think I had somehow stolen from my father's alumni something, a Xerox copied uh, article about the dream team when I was about to make my applications to college. And up until then, I had um, fervently said I had not, was going to have nothing to do with Harvard um, in rebellion and disassociation. Um, and, but something captured my attention. And the idea of being in the midst of all this was really attractive. But even when I got here, I said, oh, I'm going to do literature since I was you know, interested in writing and um, comparative literature with Spanish, since that's something I already knew about. And my advisor said, well, you keep saying you want to take AFRAM courses and film courses, but you want to be a comparative literature major. It sounds like you should be a um, AFRAM and VES concentrator and take some literature classes. And that's what I ended up doing. I was, I think at the time I was told I was the only person that had ever done those two things together, AFRAM and VES. I was a film concentrator. I had done film since before college. Um, and the number of people that I had the chance to study with here, um, during my junior year, the filmmaker Isaac Julian was brought to the, both departments, and I got to do a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with him. Um, in the VS department, Glenn Ligon and Leyland Blake were some of the artists that I studied with. Besides Adrian Kennedy, I sat with um, Jamaica Kincaid in her li literature courses. Um, but more importantly than all of that, I found myself as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, drawn every Wednesday to the weekly Du Bois colloquia. And often I was only undergraduate there. And one time, I remember my freshman year, I was coming from Dr. Gates's literature class, going up to that Mass Ave 
conference room in the elevator, and he said to me, you just can't get enough, can you? And I, I couldn't get enough. And there was a dream team also in the Du Bois, um, among the Du Bois fellows that year, a dream constellation of people that were junior scholars and postdocs then, like Brett, Brent Edwards, um, Daphne Brooks, Guy Ramsey. Um, at the wonderful Bunting Institute was Farah Jasmine Griffin. Um, the glamorous <laughs> and um, aspirational for me scholar. Um, so I got to be in a very crowded, very, very crowded conference rooms with these gentlemen, those young up and comers. Um, and I just knew then that something about the life of the mind was gonna be my path. And I, I've told Farah this story, but I've, I'll tell it publicly, which is um, one day during that literature class, Dr. Gates was absent for a class and Dr. Griffin was the, um, the substitute teacher, <laughs> so, so to speak. And it was the day that we were studying um, Gene Tumor's Kane, which was my favorite book. And I sat through that lecture and realized that I had never been taught literature by a black woman, aside from my mother, who was the first person who taught me anything about reading and writing. Um, and it was so moving and um, just, again, a, a moment of stepping on the path. Um, and so it's uh, many things converged. Among them was um, sometime in my, I think, freshman year, I was at a, there was some festival of books happening in the streets of Cambridge, and I saw the table for Transition magazine. And I said to the editor guy who was standing there, like, oh, do you take interns? And he said, yeah, we take interns. And Mike Vasquez tells a story that I didn't show up to work for three years, so somehow I didn't become an intern until like my senior year, the last semester. Um, but it absolutely was uh, decisive that I came to work because it was by joining that story, which begins on another shore and another time, um, the beginning of my work uh, as a writer really took off because both as a, as a young person, um, a, a group of team making that magazine, uh, being charged to like assess manuscripts of other people um, when I was young and didn't have that many uh, certain opinions. Um, I was able to form a, a mentorship relationship with Mike Vasquez, this incredible um, knowledgeable editor that continued after I uh, left Harvard and had already decided to be a, become a writer, not knowing my exact path. I remember my, my mother saying to me, and she was an artist, so it was interesting to, uh, to hear her say this. She's like, all of your friends are going to law school, Shreve. Like, what are you going to do? Um, and I said, I'm going to travel, I'm going to write. And Adrian Kennedy had said to me, if you write every day, um, eventually some of these other people are gonna stop writing. <laughs> and if you keep going until you're 30, you might, you might just become a writer. So that was maybe my only plan. She also told me to get a teaching job, which I said I would never do. Um, which I'm doing, <laughs> of course, at the moment. Um, I never wanted to be a teacher. Um, but when I moved to Harlem a few years after graduating, um, a few, after traveling, um, my journey in those streets, uh, conversations on street corners, I would talk to Mike about them and just say, there's, some, I, there's all this stuff going on, like all these, everyone's obsessed with history. And, I, and he would say, you just need to write this down, like write me an essay. And I didn't know how to begin, but I, but I began those, um, that essay with the words, Dear Mike, because I didn't know how else to begin, except for this very personal letter that ended up being published in Transition and became the seed of Harlem is Nowhere. Um, which I also just wanted to say, like that work really also had beginnings and, um, here, and, um, and the work that I'm doing right now, which is uh, research in Haiti um, for the second book in a trilogy, about African Americans in Utopia also began here because I was uh, a student in a, in a class by um, the historian Laurent Dubois about um, uh, revolutions, and uh, so it's it's puzzling and amazing to me that so many threads um, begin here for me that I'm still working on. Um, so I just appreciate being able to sit with you and um, reflect together and hear from the audience about your experiences too, because I know there are so many stories um, that are out there. So I, I'm really grateful and glad to be here and 
also looking forward to more years and more artists that come through these, um, these walls, finding their own path. So. Sharifa, I was, I was VES in AFRAM too. Oh, were so. you? Yeah. <laughs> like you're the only one. Why would you no, do that? You <laughs> <laughs> Terrence. All right, note, note to self, never follow a writer. <laughs> um, no, this is great. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm incredibly honored to be here as well. I, I feel like with this esteemed um, panel next to me and, and everybody in this room, I, I feel like Brandon was trying to invite Will Smith and ended up with his producing partner. And to his dismay, here I am. But um, uh, unlike uh, Brandon coming into Harvard, I actually um, had a very good sense of the Afro-Am department. Uh, it, was, it was truly, I think, even though I didn't realize that I would become a member of it, uh, it was uh, one of the big draws for me in terms of coming to this school. I, I um, grew up in... Uh, Washington, D.C., and in my household, um, names like Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Cornell West um, were household names. Um, these were, you know, as, as far as celebrities and rock stars in academia go, these are the names. And, uh, and knowing that <clears throat> was, um, was absolutely a draw for me. Um, you know, I, I arrived at Harvard still, though, not really knowing what I wanted to do, um, not knowing the path I wanted to take, certainly didn't know that I wanted to be uh, an AFAM uh, major concentrator. And, uh, and once I was here and, uh, and I got a sense of what the department really sort of looked like, that was, that was the point at which it started to really change for me. I think on, on the one hand, um, there was a draw for me just as somebody who didn't know what they wanted to do, I, I, I always had an issue with, I, I assume it's still this way, but the fact that you choose your concentration freshman year. Um, at 18, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know <laughs> what I wanted to do. I had no clue. And um, what, was, what was really so appealing to me about AFAM as opposed to so many other concentrations was how interdisciplinary it, it really was. And the idea of getting to play in literature and history and art and culture. It, it was just this sort of confluence of incredible studies um, taught by some of the best minds out there that, that made it really appealing to me. And um, as somebody who came up the son of a black man and a white woman and, and struggled with his own sense of identity and his own sense of blackness, uh, it was very important to me that I to make concerted efforts to get in touch with that side of it. I, I didn't know my mom's side, the white side of my family at all. So I, I came up uh, under my dad's side. And yet, despite the fact that I was raised in, in uh, a predominantly black household and, and almost entirely black family, um, you know, identifying there and self-identifying, I, I found challenging in my formative years. And so um, a big part of joining the, the AFAM department was wanting to get in touch with, with my roots, wanting to understand better what it meant um, to be black. And so it was, it was really, it was an incredible um, opportunity for me to do that in, you know, truly the, the best environment in, in the world um, to, to do that. Uh, you know, I, in my freshman year, um, I was just talking about this uh, upstairs with Martha Nadell. I, freshman year, I took um, AFAM with, with Professor West, uh, AFAM 10. And, and I also I had two sort of very defining formative courses uh, in my freshman year. One was AFAM 10. The other was uh, the study of W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, those two courses, I think, together really shaped my outlook on life and my path forward into sort of the world of the arts. I remember reading Souls of Black Folk, I don't remember if it was before or immediately after, or concurrently with reading Native Son and Invisible Man. And, you know, those three books 
combined, I think, really changed my perspective on the world, on what it meant to be black, on that notion of double consciousness and of the veil that um, that exists. And I think, you know, for me, uh, I never really experienced storytelling, um, narrative, art forms the same from that point on. And I think it, it, it really sent me sort of on my trajectory then into the world of arts. And um, uh, while I was in undergrad, I worked for, uh, I worked with an organization called City Step, which taught um, uh, dance and, and arts to, to local uh, uh, elementary school kids. And it was, um, it was a great program. It sort of got me one sort of toe into the world of Hollywood and entertainment. Um, at the same time, I also sort of followed in um, Sharif and Suli's uh, footsteps and, and did AFAM with a focus in um, VES. And also, um, I, I, you really, you paved a way for me, so I really appreciate it. And I, I studied under Professor Julian, too, and, um, and that was instrumental in, in setting me on my path to do my thesis on uh, mainstream black film and looking at black exploitation film and how that had affected and translated into um, films of the really films of the 1990s and looking at sort of, you know, what was commonly called ghetto pictures, um, the sort of black bourgeoisie uh, romance, um, and sort of the, the black-led comedies of that era, um, and looking at how some of the images, uh, and especially marketing of black exploitation movies translated through to, um, to film. And so as I was doing this thesis and I was um, working in sort of arts and, and producing on the city step side of things, I really decided that I wanted to go out to Hollywood and, um, and try and sort of dip my toe into that world. And, um, and I went and I took my, you know, Harvard degree and, and, uh, and school, you know, student loans and all of that and went and worked in a mail room uh, in Hollywood and, and pushed the, the mail cart to start for, for the first year and, and eventually sort of worked my way up. And I think, um, you know, I probably spent the first 10 years um, in Hollywood kind of just learning the system. Uh, and then after about 10 years, I was able, thankfully, to kind of pivot to the next 10 years um, where I've really been trying to change the system from the inside. And, um, and one of the reasons and ways that I was able to do that is because of that outlook that I had, that, that constant um, sort of memory of the notion of double consciousness. I think it, it has informed the way that I have looked at my business, my industry, um, from that point on, and you know, and so going through, I started in a, a little bit of movies, and then I went into television, and I worked at at Fox for um, quite some time, and I think even there, um, it, it really informed how I approached more broad mainstream programming. I, I did um, early on shows like. Sleepy Hollow, I don't know if anybody ever watched that show, but um, it's not exactly tailor-made for the Harvard <laughs> community, but I will say, you know, Sleepy Hollow, high concept and silly as it was, um, what was amazing to me is that I was able to kind of look at that as in the development of it and, and say, okay, there's this character who's coming back from the Revolutionary War and this Ichabod Crane and he's plopped down into contemporary America and the first version of it had him partnered up with a young white woman and I said, where's the conflict in that? That's not interesting. What happens when he's coming out here and he's partnered with a young black woman who's now a cop and in a position? And it was, again, just my experience of being here and saying, let me look at everything through this other lens of how we can tell stories differently, how we can try and imbue the the studies of race and race relations into everything that we do. And so it ended up being the, the blackest upstate New York town you ever saw in that show because I populated it that way. But, um, but the same went true with, you know, a, a show I did called Gotham, which um, was DC Comics Universe. And everyone inside of that show and the Batman universe 
was basically was white. And so we had to go out of our way to create a black character um, who was played by Jada Pinkett Smith and, and find ways to bring that in. And, and certainly with, um, with Empire, that was, that was a, a big part. Um, and and I, I think if I had actually done my thesis on looking at images from black exploitation and how they translated into mainstream media from that point on, I would have had a field day with Empire. <laughs> but um, but it, was, it was something that I was very proud of and was excited to be a part of. And so anyway, I, I, I look through what I've been able to experience in, in my time in Los Angeles and really I think my entire approach I can kind of trace back to that freshman year especially, but um, but the four years that I spent in the AFAM department um, specifically. So anyway, thank you. Sangu. Um, first, I think that I'm just grateful to be here and I'm thankful to all of you because I'm clearly standing on the shoulders of, of giants and I am a beneficiary of all the work that you all did because I joined the department during the good times. <laughs> <laughs> I joined the department during the, the, the really good times. No, but I remember when I decided to do, um, and, and th this 50th anniversary has been extraordinary. Yesterday I met President Neil Rudenstein for the first time in person. And a quick story, when I was five or six years old as a kid in Ghana, I wrote a letter to the headmaster of Harvard asking for admission. Um, six, seven months later, I got a letter back from Neil Rudenstein. And I learned two things. One was that he is not headmaster, he's president. <laughs> and the second thing I learned was that age five is a bit too early for Harvard. But it was wonderful to finally meet him in person 28 years later. Um, this department changed my life. Changed my life. When I first decided to do AAAS, I remember an uncle of mine could, till today, he cannot understand. He said, ah, and, and Skip knows the story very well. He said, you left Africa <laughs> to go to America, to study Africa. <laughs> Amira, what is wrong with your son? <laughs> could not for the world of him understand how I left Africa to come to Harvard to study Africa. But this department changed my life in a number of ways. The first was purpose. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Everyone, I, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, we need a statue honoring this department. <laughs> That's right. When, when Evelyn set up social engagement, it was more than a program. It was a call. It was, it was, it was a philosophy that says we have a moral responsibility <laughs> to take our education and use it for something beyond just intellectual gratification. Because the problems in our communities are so pressing, so serious, so demanding, that it requires all our intellectual firepower to solve them. And that has stayed with me forever. In fact, my, I was the first guinea pig for the social engagement initiative. And my, my project was not just a project in abstract. It ended up being a nonprofit that today has worked in 160 communities bringing clean water to 200,000 people. And that started with Evelyn's vision. My thesis advisor, Emanuela Champong. You know, when I first came to Harvard, I thought, ah, Emanuela Champong is from Ghana. That's my uncle now. <laughs> Until he gave me my first B plus. <laughs> I said, Uncle E. I thought we had the Ghana thing. <laughs> and Uncle Lee taught me something very serious, in all seriousness. He really pushed me to understand that as a man of color, you are going to show and exhibit excellence of the highest order. And I will give you B pluses until you show me that excellence. And when I asked him to be my thesis advisor, he t I'll never forget, he said on one condition and one condition only. Remember. You're going to go for that hoops. And we got that hoops, mm -hmm. which is Harvard's highest academic honor. The second reason, apart from giving me purpose, is this department was my home. This department was my home. You see, I grew up in Ghana where blackness meant nothing, because we were all black. 
And then I came to the US where I started to understand what it meant to be black in America in ways that were not exactly friendly. Um, Brandon Terry, I knew Brandon when I was a high school student visiting Harvard. And I had never met a young black man speak so eloquently as Brandon Terry did. <laughs> and if he didn't know then, I knew then he would become a Harvard professor. <laughs> but I remember we were playing football in the quad, BMF and Aboa. That's right. yeah. I was just a freshman, excited to be here. Finally seeing my five, six-year-old dream come true. And they called the cops on us. They called the cops on us. And, and that started a journey of me having to navigate what it meant to be black in America. And where it struck me was, I got, after leaving Harvard, I got a master's in international human rights law at Oxford. And I left my dorm in New College. And I was walking to a Tesco to pick up some stuff. And I grabbed it. And I, I don't take plastic because I'm trying to, to help the environment. So I carried it, paid for it, forgot to take my receipt. <coughs> and as I walked out, the alarm went off. And immediately, I dropped everything, and I just lay on the floor, and I spread my arms. The security guard walked over, and he was more traumatized than I was. They don't even carry guns in England. <laughs> <laughs> and he was shaking, and he said, I am so sorry, sir. It, it's fine. And I remember walking back to my dorm and I was shaken because m my reaction would not make sense to the regular bystander. Right. But what it triggered for me growing up for the past 15 years as a black man in America was I was trying to live. And it, it, it struck me then how much that experience of being black in America what it does to you, how it literally changes who you are and how you react to certain stimuli, even when you're in a different environment where police don't carry guns. And what has helped me to navigate this has been this department. This department. Uncle Skip. Every time I've had, there have been different situations I've had where he's always come to my aid. In fact, my book, he wrote the foreword. And he wrote a really incredible touch and forward for me. And, and there have been so many other people in this department who have, they've been not just professors, but these are my mentors, these are my advisors, right. these are the people I call on anytime I am in the throes of darkness. And so I, I keep saying that what's different about this department and what makes this department different from the economics department or, or the political science department or any other department is for people of color, this is home. And when you're navigating a terrain that even 50 years post the founding of the department still isn't as friendly when you don't necessarily look like what they expect a Harvard student to be. When you're walking into your dorm and they shut the door, because they're not sure you belong. When you still do not fit the picture of what they imagine when they think of a Harvard student, even when you have three degrees from this institution. This department is home. This department is, is the resting place. It is the bosom on which our weary heads rest as students when we are confused and we do not know how to navigate whiteness. And so it's beyond just the academic excellence. It is, it is the spiritual home of people of color at this university. And finally, the third thing that I learned from this department that has carried me forward was that it is not enough to just go and fight for our rights and to make noise. It's going to, to sustain what this department has done and to keep us going for the next 50 years, ladies and gentlemen. It is going to require sacrifice, financial sacrifice. Let's face it. If we want more professors of color, we need more endowed chairs that would ensure that we have these professors of color. And I understood through this department those levers, and that's why... At a young age, I have already committed a million dollars to black causes, majority of which went to Harvard to endow funds, the first of which went to honor Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham to support social engagement.
because it is not a given that what we celebrate today will continue. It is not a given. These gains can go away tomorrow with a different administration. And so it's not enough for us to sit and rest on the, the charity of those in power. We need to sustain and hold on to those gains. And those gains will only be sustained and held on with economic power. And that's why we need to make sure that we preserve what we have today by donating, by endowing, and by ensuring that a thousand years from now, we will still have AAAS, and it will be incredible, it will be extraordinary, and it will have an outsized impact all over the world. Mm -hmm. Because the world demands this. Africa today is 1.2 billion people. In 2050, Africa will be 2.5 billion. One in four people will be African. So there is no greater urgency, and there is no greater moment for the importance of the studying of people of African descent and of the African continent. So thank you for inviting me to be in this panel. And I stand here as a testament and as a beneficiary of the extraordinary generosity, the love, the nourishment, and the excellence of all of you. Here, here. Um, so there's just so many rich, uh, incisive contributions in this panel. Uh, I have a million questions I want to ask, but I do see we're like we're, we're running slightly over time, so I want to make sure that the audience gets a chance to ask some questions too. The one thing I will permit myself a chance to ask, and it just picks up on a thing that that Songo ended on. Um, so, so often, I think, I'm trying to put this the exact right way, but when, when we gather in these spaces, we focus a lot on the challenges going forward. What are the obstacles and pitfalls for our field going forward? And I just want to turn the angle of that question slightly, because you are all making such an extraordinary mark on um, many different fields. And I want to ask, what do you think are the great opportunities for African and African American studies over the next 50 years? What are those places, particularly outside of the academy, right, where we can make a really serious, profound impact, but that you think maybe people haven't quite grasped that? That's not something that's at the forefront of our self-conception at present, but that as you had you, as people who have this training and have gone out into the world and become leading figures, you know, what are those things that we might try to put more centrally as part of our agenda going forward over the next 50? Sharifa. Can I begin? It, what comes to mind immediately is something that's just so simple, which as much as we are all gathered here in the name of this um, cause and call, the really basic work is still to be done which is putting books in the hands of people that wouldn't have them. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity um, a few years ago, uh, in 2015, when it was coming on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X, I took over a storefront in the Teresa Hotel building um, to create a, a learning space uh, for young people and for community people just to um, grapple with the undone work of the organization of Afro-American Unity. Um, and bring artists in to, to that space and to bring young people who were court involved in that space. And we got to give them copies of the autobiography. And so many people, so many of those students just didn't even know who he was. Like that might, that's entry level and easy to do. And so the idea that this department is already doing the work of social engagement, I mean, that's basic and, and it's a first step and some of those people you know, circulated back into my life in other, other ways, and it was the beginning of something. So the idea of like books and hands is like the, the basic, the first work always, and it's been, the, it's been the first work for so many years. So that's just the ground for us. I'd like to follow up on that. I think Sharifa is exactly right. I think, again, for someone looking at the department now after having been away, one of the things that's striking is how inclusive it is. Um, the, the faculty is one of the most diverse on the Harvard campus. The students 
are among the most diverse on the Harvard campus. And issues of diversity and inclusion are issues that this country and the world are going to be facing in the years to come. Uh, Sangu pointed out that you know one out of every four people will be African. Um, it's not clear that the rest of the world has grasped that and can deal with that. And I think one of the social engagement responsibilities and opportunities for this department is to, through its work, help others both understand and appreciate the cultures of difference, the cultures that are around us, that surround us, and that we will be engaged in over time because we'll be engaged with so many different people, both in the African diaspora and in Africa. And so I think looking ahead, that's something I think this department is well placed to lead, uh, not just the academy, but the community in general. I think Going off that, a lot of the problems we face is, is going to require this multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach. And I'll, uh, quick examples on that. When I was doing my water project in Ghana for my thesis, the, you know, if you just went and just took a simple analysis of the water infrastructure, there was an abandoned well, and the simple cost-benefit economic analysis would be rehabilitate the well. And Evelyn is smiling because she knows this story. So that was the initial intervention. But because we went through the lens of AAAS, we first had to do a history of the community. We took an anthropological perspective. We did qualitative, we did all of that, only to find out that if we had rehabilitated the well, the intervention would have failed. Why? Because several years ago, about a decade prior to us coming in, a, a girl with mental illness had fallen in the well and had died. And so, you know, Social mores and cultural taboos and all that stuff would have prevented the community from ever drinking water from that well. And so if we had just gone in with our simple economic analysis and rehabilitated that well, we would have wasted all that money. Um, Ebola is another clear example where it wasn't enough to just look at it from a medical perspective because you would have failed. You wouldn't have seen why is it that it's spreading in certain communities because of certain cultural elements there. Why is it that um, in Liberia, for example, if you actually look at what was going on with the spread, part of it was rooted in severe distrust that some communities had in government. And so there were some communities that actually thought the government was making this up to just be able to raise some international funding. And so you kind of need to have that holistic multidisciplinary approach to actually be able to create the sort of solutions that we need to resolve these sorts of big issues. I mean, corona is now on everyone's mind. It's a similar thing. And, and this department is already very well positioned to do that. Right? We have faculty from across all the different disciplines. I, when I was doing my work, I worked with Michael Kramer in economics. I worked with Alan Hill in the School of Public Health. And so there's a sense in which we've already set the template here for the way we need to approach problem solving for the future. The future is already here. I mean, there's already been a huge change, and I would agree. Um, I have, my two teenagers are here, and you know, every year they come home and say, "Mom, we're learning slavery again." You know, and I, I never learned slavery in high school, and I think it's already permeating. FRM is already permeating our schools, and it could do. We live in D.C., so of course, but you know, there are more communities where that's not the case, and so, you know, I think everything we're learning here. Uh, like I said, it's it's the history of America, and um, you know I think reaching our young people is definitely one of the things that we can do more. The only other thing I would add is, um, uh, you know, I think I look around this room and and see the the members of of this department over the years, and I think about how incredibly impressive everyone is, and and my industry is very much built on the notion of networking and, and who you know and who your relationships are are everything in, in that town. And I think the idea of the network that we have is extraordinary to me and that's already built and that we can take advantage of. And so, you know, I, I think it's maybe a, a little bit obvious, but when I think of so many of my other friends in, in the Harvard community who, um, you know, have that that sort of Harvard network out in the world, 
Um, we got a network. This AFAM network is powerful, incredibly powerful. And, uh, and you know, I think it's, it can be easy to lose sight of that. I, I myself am guilty of drifting away from the department um, over the years and, and, and sort of getting back in touch only sporadically. And I think it's incredibly important that we all stay close, stay in touch, stay networked, because there is power in numbers, and especially when those numbers include the people in this room and watching online and part of the, the, the alumni of this, uh, this incredible department. So, yeah. Well, I want to take a few questions from the audience. We have a little bit of time. Uh, and when you ask a question, please identify yourself. You know, we're all coming from lots of different generations, lots of different places. We don't all know each other. And just as a reminder, all questions end in question marks. <laughs> I love your manifesto, but we're trying to have a dialogue and some engagement. Professor Gates. <laughs> Can you hear me? I just wanted to explain to Sue Lee and Zaheer and the other people who were occupying that building a little bit about the role of Barbara Johnson. Barbara Johnson is the, uh, passed all, all too soon, but she was one of my best friends from Yale. We were junior professors together. She came to the bunting fell in love with Marge Garber, and moved, and Harvard fell in love with her. Um, she got a job offer from Stanford, or no, from Berkeley, and uh, Marge got one from Stanford. They were out there on sabbatical, and Derek Bach called and said, you cannot leave Harvard. What do you want to stay? And she said, I want to be the chair of Afro-Am. And he goes, what? You know, that's it? She goes, yes. But the reason is, she had a plan to hire me. And I told her it was never going to work. It just was, I had no, it just, I couldn't even imagine that uh, it would work. And an appointment with the English department. And Barbara engineered that whole thing. She was the architect behind my recruitment. Uh, and she, she did, that. and then after I was hired, she, she got out of FOM. I mean, she really um, came in, she had an agenda, she spent one year, and it all worked out. So I just wanted you to know that that, that is the story behind uh, the story, and that's why her picture's up, well, all the chairs' picture's up are in the, the department. But um, without Barbara Johnson, I would, wouldn't have been here. And I think a lot of us wouldn't have been either because she taught black woman writers and it was a huge, wonderful class. And, uh, you know, she was holding it down, seriously, when there was no one there, so. I gave her, uh, their eyes were watching God she'd never read. We were in the yellow Hi, I'm Dr. Kamara Jones. I'm currently a Radcliffe Fellow, which is the new iteration of the Bunting Fellows and a former faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health many years ago, from 94 to 2000. And as I am soaking in the wonders of the 50 years and the history and some of the founders, I have become aware that on this campus right now, and maybe, you don't, maybe some of you don't even know about this effort, so, or maybe this is a controversial question, I'm, I don't know, so it's a real question in my mind. There is an effort to develop a department of ethnic studies now at Harvard. And I don't know if some of the people who, are, who have founded the Department of African and African American Studies or some of the faculty have uh, suggestions for people who want to do that, or is there a stance, is there a departmental stance, one way or the other about the need or not? And so I'm not trying to throw a bomb in the room, but I'm really curious uh, because I don't know. So I put that question to anybody who would want to answer. I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, when I was preparing to come here, I was looking through uh, the news about sit-ins at Harvard. And of course, we just had all of this activity over ethnic studies. And so, <clears throat> oh, sure. There was all this activity over ethnic studies. And it, it sounds like they've done a lot more than we, we ever did. Um, and you know, more power to them. 
Um, that's, you know, not an easy task. It sounds like they're being quite creative. I was actually last night having a discussion about all the different uh, avenues of protest that they're taking petitions. I mean, um, you know, whatever we did, they're taking it to the 10th. And so I hope them success. The one thing I want to add to that is I was at the law school when we had the big movement, Royal Must Fall, and the seal was removed. But I remember at the time, I felt then and I still feel now that it was a, it was a, it was a missed opportunity in the sense that we just focused on the seal. But if you, if you look now, if you go and you talk to students of color at the law school they, who were not around during that activism, there's nothing else there in terms of there's nothing to sustain that, which is, you know, if, if we had pushed and we had had, let's say, um, endowed positions to bring more faculty of color or we had um, critical, you know, legal theory studies or something that would make sure that it happens forever. So, so my advice would be um, to, to those trying to organize for this is you, you have to think about what are the economic levers. For example, if there's an endowed chair for ethnic studies, it, it solves that, right? And so if, if, if you, if you, if you it's, it's, it's more than just trying to make it happen, right? It, it's really thinking through what's going into the creation of that department. And it's, it's a budget, right, to be able to hire the professors you need, to be able to have the programs you need. And, and if they, they really need to work on that to make sure that how can you get alumni who are interested in this to, as uh, my favorite artist Jay-Z says, be a bully with the box. Because <laughs> that's what Harvard listens to. Um, so we're running out of time. I, I just want to... Um, Brandon, I think there's... Yeah, so do we have time for one more? Or, okay, last question. I am very happy to be here. I was invited only a few days ago, and I wasn't planning to come. I'm very happy I came. I'm very touched by what my dear friend Miles Link said. He is the cause for my. He, he, he is the culprit who convinced me to accept the position because I, too, myself at the beginning was very doubtful that the university was committed to this cause. I had an offer to go back to Ethiopia, and I had other offers. I had just finished my PhD in Near Eastern Studies. And when Musgrave <coughs> called me and said, well, we'd like to hire you, and uh, you'll be the first uh, person to be hired, I said, I will only accept the job for one year because I'm going back to Ethiopia. Well, he said, there is not such a thing. You have to accept uh, a position for five years. And I thought about it, and I said, well, and he said, you know, you can accept the job for five years. After a year, you can go back to Ethiopia. Well, I just wanted to say I'm really very happy to be here in spite of the fact that I came late. I can say much more about this department because probably in all due humility, I'm the only individual in this room who for the first seven years was involved in the struggle to this department. I feel sitting here like at the root of, among the people who were the roots of a tree, whose tree has now become big, big branches and beautiful fruits. So I just really wanted to say that because I felt like I have to say, I'm so happy to see the branches and the fruits of the tree that was very, very much a tree that was in a dry, in a dry desert <laughs> and uh, trying to suck water from um, a university. In fact, I'll just all say that I, respect Harvard, I love Harvard, but I was never impressed by it. When Derek Buck once called me to his office, he said, I want you on the Du Bois Institute. And I said, Professor Gunir should be, I'm not the chairman. He said, I don't like him. I said, President Buck, you don't know I am an Ethiopian. We Ethiopians do not worship Europeans. What you're trying to do is to you don't understand I'm a self-respecting Ethiopian. We always respect white people, but we don't bow before them. What you're trying to do is to buy me. Well, I can tell you many, many stories like this. So in short, I'm sorry. 
I do, I'm taking so much time. I'm so grateful that I came. I'm grateful to Miles Link <coughs> for having forced, <laughs> told me. If, if I didn't talk to him, he said, we are a pan-African people. You should not, because I, I had my own doubts about the beginning of this program. So I'm grateful to Skip, especially also, for having succeeded like a magician to do exactly what we wanted to do a combined African and African-American program. That was a struggle. That was a struggle. You all must have read the reports at the beginning that this department, I was told by, I respect Dean Rozovsky for, for his contribution to the program. But you know, he sat in front of me at, at lunch at Harvard Club and said, you're from Ethiopia. You have history, you have culture. What have you got to do with black studies? And the last word I say is, when he denied me tenure, he called me and said, we're denying you tenure in African-American. You're from Near Eastern languages and literature, where you got your PhD. I'll offer you two years, go to that department, and then we'll reconsider you. I said, I have taught in this department six years. I'm not going to be bought, so I'm going to fight against you. He offered me such a job. Why? Because you don't belong there. Well, anyway, I can say much more, but I don't want to take too much time. Thank you very much. I'm very happy. I want, to, I want you all to thank again our panelists. Thank all of the folks in the audience for their great questions, contributions. Um, I hope all of the alums in the room take to heart uh, what's been said here, that this department has survived a lot of difficult times and become a powerhouse, but it's only done it through sacrifice. It's only done it through the contributions of students and it needs the contributions of alumni. It needs time, it needs talent, it needs treasure. It needs to build out this network. Uh, and this should be a real um, touchstone moment where we go forward with a new relation to our alums uh, and that they never forget that this is home because this should be home even when you've left Cambridge. So thank you. We'll start the next panel very shortly on the PhD is challenges and possibilities. Very short break. Thank you.